Well, good morning once again, church. It's a blessing to be with you this Good Friday. It's always a privilege to be behind this pulpit and preach God's uh, word. It's always, I count it a blessing. Um, and so I trust that we will be blessed this morning. If you've noticed over my last few messages, we've been taking a look at some of the great 316 verses in the Bible. We've touched on 1 Timothy 316, which speaks about uh, Christ's incarnation and his atoning work. We've touched on Colossians 316, which speaks about the word of Christ and how it is profitable for, for the Christian. We've also touched on 2 Timothy 3.16, which speaks about uh, the Word of God, and how it, it is also profitable for the Christian. But this morning, we're going to take a look at one of the most famous of all 3.16 verses in the Bible. That is, of course, John 3.16. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to take them and turn with me to John's Gospel. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. This is, of course, the famous story about Nicodemus seeking our Lord by night. John chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 1 all the way down to verse 18. So the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Friends, the title for today's message is The Charity the condemnation and the choice. The charity, the condemnation and the choice. We see in this passage of scripture the life-giving words of the Saviour whom spells out the message of salvation so very clearly. So I thought it most proper for us this Good Friday to delve into these great, awesome and wonderful truths of the gospel message. I want to address and make mention of three differing points specifically from verses 16 to 18. If we look into them with the help of the Holy Spirit, it shall bless us greatly. One, the charity and the gift of the Saviour. Two, the condemnation of sinners. And three, the choice that all mankind must make. Before I begin, let's, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for Jesus who died on that cross for us. Lord, we just pray this morning as we open up into this gospel truth, Lord, that you would uh, speak to us here this morning. If there be any that know not the saving grace of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would direct them, that you would guide them, and that you would save them by your word and through your grace. O oh, Lord, fill me as your servant here this morning with your Holy Spirit, that I may preach your word with boldness, with clarity, that your saints may be edified, and that your name would be glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. The congregation, we see in our text, the third chapter of John's Gospel, a most beloved and very well-read passage of Scripture. No doubt millions of saints down the ages have been blessed by, have been impacted and saved by this conversation our Lord has with this Pharisee Nicodemus. 
So it begins by this Pharisee, Nicodemus, coming to uh, our Lord by night. The inquirer sought our Lord by night, perhaps with the fear of his religious companions, for indeed they were against our Lord from the beginning. So we note we see a secret disciple, a secret believer, and herein lies a message for us all. But too often many a Christian want to keep them faith, their faith to themselves and never dare to venture out of their comfort zone. But I believe the scriptures say otherwise. We have the light of Christ and therefore must shine that light unto others whom are trapped in the darkness of sin and unbelief. Jesus Christ said so much in his wonderful Sermon on the Mount as he taught his disciples. He said, ye are the lights of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give, giveth light unto all them that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Church, we shine not our own light, but we rather shine the light of Jesus Christ. For this dying world needs the message of truth. This dying world needs the message of love. This dying world needs the message of salvation through the light of Christ's glorious gospel. And we as his representatives must endeavour to give them that very message. Amen. Friend, be not be ashamed to be called a Christian. Rather, yell it from the rooftop that all may know your association with Christ. That all may know that you have a glorious message for them. That all may know that they can be saved by the precious blood of the Lamb. And so our conversation between, this, between our Lord and this Pharisee continues. And our Lord proclaims to Nicodemus the pressing need of his heart, and indeed the need of all the hearts of all men, that all of Adam's sinful and dying race must be born again. Look down at verse 3, church, where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ here powerfully proclaims the necessity of the truth of regeneration. And for emphasis, he repeats again in verse 5, because we who are dead in sins are totally incapable of saving ourselves, and therefore we must be born again from above by God quickening our spirit through faith and faith alone. Then and only then are we made a new creation in Christ and receive his life, we receive his righteousness, and that is the greatest miracle of all. Indeed, there are many great miracles we see in Scripture, but I believe the greatest of all miracles is the salvation of a sinful man's soul. This is not done or accomplished by the flesh. This is not done or accomplished by our works, but rather by the Spirit of a living God imputing his righteousness unto us by faith. For this teacher of the Jews believed that in order to enter into the kingdom, one must produce good works. One must produce a holy and righteous lifestyle. But my friend, he was wrong. He was ignorant of the reality of scriptures. This teacher of religion ought to have known these kingdom truths of salvation by faith, but it said he was blinded by the erroneous interpretations of man. And sadly, there's no difference today. For many in this day, advocate a salvation by faith plus works. Faith plus joining a church. Faith plus water baptism. But here, our Lord clearly and definitively states in his conversation with Nicodemus that salvation is achieved by Christ's atoning work on the cross alone. Look at verse 14, church. Verse 14, Jesus explains both the agonizing way he was to die, to take away sins, and how that salvation could then be applied to the individual. He says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Dearly beloved, we note in these verses, by our Lord being lifted up on Calvary's cross, salvation was made available to all and upon all them that would believe. That by Jesus being hung on that cross, being made a curse for us, shedding his blood, eternal life was now available to anyone who had placed their faith in him. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. To illustrate this, our Lord uses the story from Numbers 21, which Nicodemus would no doubt be very well acquainted with. And in this story, we see the nation of Israel in rebellion and in sin. And because of this, God judges them and sending upon them fiery serpents. Moses then, as instructed, intercedes for the people. 
and makes up a brazen serpent and lifts it up on a pole that anyone who would look upon that pole, look upon that snake, would be delivered. This, though, pictures a greater truth than that of salvation from physical death as it demonstrates the gospel message of salvation of a sinful soul. We, too, are just like the Israelites spiritually in rebellion against God and have been bitten by an even more severe bite, which is sin. And the only remedy or condition for our condition is to look unto the crucified Christ of God, to look up to the lifted up Saviour at Calvary's cross in faith. Then and only then shall we be delivered from our sins. So the question is, do you believe? Are you a whosoever that believeth? Do you believe in the crucified, buried and risen Christ alone for your salvation or are you trusting in yourself, in your church attendance, the fact that you were born into a Christian family or that you were baptised or you've done many good works? Friends, none of that will do. But the only way to God is through faith and faith alone in the cross of Christ. I trust that where, where your faith is this morning. And so we come to our key text in verse 16. And I note the divine charity and the gift of the Saviour. The divine love which God has for all of Adam's sinful and dying race. My focus on two points. The divine charity and the divine gift. So first, the divine charity. Please uh, keep your place in John chapter 3. We're going to be back there throughout this morning. But I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I'll read the text again in John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. No doubt Nicodemus must have thought himself special, being a Jew, being one with which the oracles of God were delivered to, the promises and the covenants. But here our Lord has not only the Jewish nation in mind, but those of the Gentiles, Gentiles as well. Indeed, the entirety of Adam's race. I note, dear saints, that it is God's love for all of sinful humanity that the Father was willing to offer up his divine Son, indeed his only Son. For he loved us so much, he did not, did not offer up an angel. He did not offer up a created being, but he offered up his divine and most precious Son, not just to take away the sins of the Jewish people, but for the sins of the whole world. You see, there are some, especially in the Reformed traditions, who would espouse that God did not love the entire world. He only loved the elect. Only those would inherit salvation. They advocate erroneously that Jesus died only for the elect and not for the world. This is a doctrine known as limited atonement. But friend, this is not what the text states. This is antithetical to the scriptures. The Holy Bible declares that he is the saviour of all men, especially them that believe. The Holy Bible says that he so loved the world. The Holy Bible says that he is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. The Holy Bible says that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Church, the Father's love is clearly demonstrated to the whole world in the fact that he gave of his only begotten Son, not just for the elect, but for all of mankind. That is what the Scriptures declare. That is what we must believe. Not man's interpretations, but the interpretations in which the Holy Ghost speaks. But to have this salvation effectual to your soul, you must believe. You must be born again. This is precisely what our Lord is referring to and explaining to his inquirer, Nicodemus. So if you're there in 1 John chapter 4, look down at verse 7. Where the Apostle John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. For everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Friends, the message of the gospel is one of love. A message of divine love which the triune God has for all of Adam's wretched sinful race. I note in the text in, John, in uh, 1 John 4 in verse 10, the Apostle Paul, Apostle John rather, spells out this for us. And he says, herein is love, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us. Such divine charity which is manifested and clearly demonstrated at the cross of Calvary. As our Lord was being nailed to that cursed cross, he was taking upon himself the sins of the world. After he had been mocked, lied about, spitting upon, beaten, humiliated, after being scourged and eventually lifted up on that cruel cross, we see a sign written in three languages, in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek, for all the world to see the accusation written. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. What a glorious message which could read like this. Behold, look upon Jesus, Jehovah whom saves. Look upon the one whom has been mar beyond human rec recognition. The one whom, as the prophet Isaiah so prophesied 700 years prior, he said he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted of grief. Look upon the one whom has been smitten of God and afflicted. Look upon the one who has been wounded for our transgressions and has been bruised for our iniquities. Look upon the one whom God hath laid the iniquity of us all. We see the gospel messages, as John said in his epistle, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. The Bible says elsewhere that God commendeth or demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, how sinful and undeserving we are, but how loving and merciful the message of the gospel is. For it is not man reaching up to God, but it is God reaching down unto wretched, hopeless mankind in the person and work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I proclaim to you this morning, this is the greatest love of all. This is indeed charity divine. We also note in our text in John 3.16, the divine gift, the divine gift for God so loved the world that he gave of his only begotten Son. The gift of Christ is most assuredly a divine gift, for he is the second person of the triune God. The divine gift is salvation through the offering of his Son. It is a most precious and a gift most necessary, necessary to the sinner. Timothy, once again, church, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Sadly, today, many reject this gift. They, offer the, they reject the free offer of salvation through Jesus and instead try to offer up their own salvation to God. Wretched mankind offer up to a holy and righteous God their good works and think this is acceptable. People offer up religious ceremonies and think this is also acceptable. But I tell you the truth, this is futile, for the only type of works the Father shall accept is the perfect works of Jesus Christ at the cross. Your works are, as Isaiah said, filthy rags before a holy and righteous God. May I remind you, church, of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says, For by grace are you saved through what? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The grace gift of God the Father is the free offer of salvation through God the Son. That whoever believes in him accepts his terms of salvation by accepting the free gift of redemption is saved from his sins. If you see, church, a gift by definition is free. It is not earned, it's not worked for, but it's freely given by the giver. For example, on your birthday, you receive a gift. You receive a present. Is it earned? Is it worked for? No. No. It is freely given, and so it is in God's economy and in God's salvation. The gracious Lord, through his merciful and loving nature, offers sinful, condemned, and wretched mankind salvation as a gift through Christ. This is where, I pick, this is where we picked up in Romans chapter 5. Look down at verse 18. Where the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Friends, because we are descendants of Adam, we have inherited a sin nature and are by nature children of wrath, destined for condemnation in the lake of fire. But as the Apostle Paul proclaims a little later in chapter 6, he says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a glorious redemption we have in the Saviour. Amen. Amen. Here in Romans 5, though, our great Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, is comparing the two Adams, the first and the last. We know that the first Adam failed, 
And because of this, all men stand in condemnation before a holy and righteous God. But we also know that Jesus, the second Adam, stepped in to creation and by his righteous life succeeded where Adam failed and in doing so offering up himself on the cross as a divine substitute and has given us salvation as a gift. A gift we simply don't deserve, yet he gives it anyway. The free gift of salvation through the Son. And if we accept this gracious gift, we no longer identify with Adam, but we are identified with Christ. We no longer identify with our sins, but we are identified with the righteousness of the Saviour. What a thought to dwell on this Good Friday. The Scriptures declare in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For you have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made, what? The righteousness of God in him. You see, upon our Lord Jesus was laid our blasphemy. Upon our Lord Jesus was laid our lusts. Upon him was laid theft, adultery, all manner of wickedness. Indeed, the sins of the whole world, as he was made a curse for us. He, upon that dreaded cross, received the wrath of the Father, and yet we receive his righteousness by faith. What an incredible exchange. He received our deserving wrath and yet we receive his righteousness as a gift through faith. What a glorious exchange, church, we see at the cross. One with which we praise him for this morning and there's a reason why we call it Good Friday. Amen. So I ask once again, dear congregation, have you received the free gift? Have you received Christ Jesus? Have you come to the end of yourself and realised that you stand condemned before a holy and righteous God? Have you by faith accepted God's free offer of salvation? For indeed it is free. If you have, I rejoice with you as do the angels in heaven. But if you have yet to taste of forgiveness, if you have yet to reach out your hand to the Saviour in, in faith, I pray that today shall be your day. Today shall be the end. You come to the end of yourself, the end of your striving, the end of offering up to God your dead works and receive by faith, simple childlike faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. For indeed, he is the most glorious, he is the most unspeakable gift of all. Amen. So we've seen that text this morning from John 3.16, the charity and the divine gift of the Saviour. We also note that we see the condemnation of sinners. The condemnation of sinners. We cannot have true charity without condemnation. For true love must have alongside it true justice. For what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God must execute. If you look down uh, once again at John chapter 3, John chapter 3 and verse 17, the Bible says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Friends, the purpose for the first advent of Christ, for his incarnation into this world, was not to condemn, it was to save no doubt this statement must have been troubling to his hearer, Nicodemus, who was most probably of the school of thought that when the Messiah was to come, he was to destroy and to condemn his enemies and to set up his glorious kingdom and throne of David. Now these prophecies were to come and are to come, but first must come Jesus, Jehovah whom saves and deal with the issue of sin. The prophesied seed of the woman who would have his heel bruised by Satan, but in return, through his death and resurrection, bruised the head of the serpent in complete victory over sin, complete victory over death, complete victory over hell. This is the reason for Christ's first advent and is witnessed elsewhere in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, writing unto uh, Timothy, his protege, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Indeed, we are chief sinners. We are worthy of death and hell, but praise God, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from such condemnation. For verily, we were born into this world. We are sinners by nature and by practice. And we need, need, need not tell anyone how to sin. They do it most naturally. I note in our text in John 3.18, though, that those who have not accepted Christ as Saviour are condemned already, meaning they are not yet in hell, that is their rightful destination. Oh, but one step away, one moment away from everlasting destruction if they do not accept his free offer of salvation. Because my friend, there is a day coming when this age of grace shall come to an end and the door of opportunity shall be swung shut either by death or by the return of Christ. 
and with the condemnation he brings to unbelieving sinners. Indeed, if unsaved, the Bible says that you are condemned already. This is the most definitely a fearful and sobering matter to contemplate. If you would, church, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. As we noted in the first advent of Christ, it was one of salvation, one of deliverance from sin, but the second advent should not be so. But rather, he shall bring condemnation to sinners. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Again at verse 6, church. The Bible says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with, uh, with, them, with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven and with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The congregation we see in these scriptures, the condemnation and judgment with which our Lord brings to the unbelieving world at his second coming. May I first explain the differences between the rapture and the second advent? For often the two are fused together, but we see in scripture a stark difference between the two. Therefore, the Bible says we must rightly divide the word of truth. At the rapture, Christ returns in the air, but at his second coming, he returns to the earth. At the rapture, Christ comes secretly for the church. But at the second coming, he comes openly with his church. The rapture is an imminent event. But the second coming occurs at the end of the tribulation period. And lastly, at the rapture, believers escape the coming tribulation. But at the second coming, unbelievers shall experience the tribulation and the judgment which is to come. Church, how blessed we are to escape the coming tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble to escape the judgment which is to come upon the whole earth, the wrath of which God will pour out upon this earth in his righteous indignation. It brings to mind the psalmist who prophetically wrote in Psalm 2, Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Oh, how blessed we are who have kissed the sun. Oh, what rest we shall experience at the rapture. For those, but for those who are left behind, they shall not experience rest, but rather they shall experience the wrath of Almighty God. A sobering matter to contemplate this morning. So what kind of wrath shall the unbelieving, Christ-rejecting sinner experience? What shall be his deserving end? What shall be the extent of his condemnation? May I bring to your attention this morning, but a few ways the sinner will be recompensed for his evil deeds. Listen carefully. The scriptures declare there shall be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. There shall be shame, hatred, and the stench of sulfur. There shall be in the conscious mind of the condemned regret and anguish of spirit for all the opportunities he had to receive salvation. They who have rejected Christ shall experience the torments of unquenchable fire and an inability to cool the tip of their tongue with water. The condemned shall spend the rest of eternity separated from the love of God and in the presence of Satan and his fallen angels. There should be no, more, no way out, no more opportunities, no more offers of salvation, but their fate shall be sealed. And instead of eternal life, they'll experience eternal suffering in the lake of fire. This, my dearly beloved, is a sobering matter to dwell on. For unrepentant mankind, there, this remains their fate. This shall be their end. Though some may argue that a loving God would not send sinners to hell, but my friend, the Bible is plain in the matter. The Bible is also clear that if you reject Christ, you reject life. And thus pain, suffering, tribulation shall be your companions forever in the domain of the lake of fire. For a quarreling sinner is ignorant of the great holiness of God and the reality that sin must be punished. That all that transgress the law of God must be judged. Thus as Jesus Christ prayed so famously in the garden of Gethsemane, thy will be done. So too does he respect the free will decision of men. For if the transgressor rejects the offer of salvation, the Father shall then say unto him, Thy will be done, and hell shall be his end. But if the transgressor accepts the offer of salvation, then again he shall say unto him, Thy will be done, and heaven shall be his glorious end. For all sinners must make a decision 
We must take, make a choice. And thus we come to my third and final point this morning. The choice that all mankind must make. There is a choice that all mankind must make. Look down once again at our, our uh, text in John chapter 3. In verse 18, the Lord says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. My friends, as I noted earlier, the present state uh, of believers, how they are already standing in condemnation before God and are but one step away from hell, so too is the present tense state position of those who have believed in Christ, which are but one moment away from a glorious future in heaven. Amen. They that have believed upon the name of the Son of God have already passed from death unto life. They have already been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. They have already been saved and therefore shall never come into condemnation before God as they have, have at the moment of faith, at the moment of faith, been judicially accredited with the righteousness of Christ. Oh, what assurance the scriptures bring us in reference to our eternal salvation. We who have believed can in confidence say we are heaven bound. We who have believed can in confidence say we are, the, we are righteous because of Christ. We who believe can in confidence say because of the witness of the word and the witness of the spirit, we shall never perish. Do you have that confidence this morning? Are you assured of your salvation, of your eternal state? If not, believe the words of Christ who said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I also want to bring to your attention this morning, in addition to the security of the believer, I note the contrast betwixt the saved and the unsaved, those that believe and those that do not. For there are but two camps, two types of people in this world, those that are saved, those that are lost, those who are righteous, those who stand condemned, those who are in Christ, those who are in Adam, those who are saints, those who are sinners, those of light, those of darkness, those of Christ's kingdom, those of Satan's kingdom those which are the children of God and those which are the children of wrath and of Satan. There is a stark distinction between the two groups in Scripture. This is evidenced a little bit later in John's Gospel in chapter 3 where John the Baptist echoes this. He says that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There can be no middle ground, no fence sitting when it comes to the Gospel message. As we've seen, there are but two options, belief in the Saviour or rejection of the Saviour. Accepting the Son or neglecting the Son. Receiving eternal life or receiving eternal wrath. For you see, dear congregation, there are many choices which we see throughout Scripture. But the most pressing, the most necessary decision one must make in this church age is whether or not to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, we have such an incredible example of this at the scene of our Lord's crucifixion. He was numbered upon among the transgressors. If you would, the last place I'll have you turn this morning is to Luke chapter 23. If you have your Bibles there, a few pages to your left in the Bible. Luke chapter 23. We're going to read from verses 32 all the way down to 43. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verses 32 to 43. The Bible says, There were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, deriding him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocking him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription was written over him in the letters of Greek, in Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which, which hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto him, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We see in our text at the crucifixion of Christ, on either side of this righteous and sinless Son of Man were two thieves, two sinners, worthy of judgment, worthy of hell, justly condemned to death by the Romans. One received him, the other rejected him. One cried out in faith, the other mocked and ridiculed him. One acknowledged our Lord, the other did not. And the same decision stands today, stands before us. I may I bring your attention to this deathbed conversion, as it were, three points which teach us the simplicity of this man's salvation. Number one, the realisation of sin. The realisation of sin. Look down at verse 40. And he proclaims, Does thou not fear God, seeing we are in the same condemnation? For we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. This penitent thief acknowledged that he was a sinner and that he realised that he stood in condemnation. My friend, if you will not acknowledge your sin, if you will not acknowledge your judgment, there is no hope for you. But as the Apostle Paul proclaims, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible also proclaims that after death cometh the judgment, and this malefactor acknowledged this great reality, that he fell short of God's holiness, and therefore, because of this, his reward would be the horrors of hell. Number two, this man also had a realisation of the Saviour, a realisation of the Saviour. Look down at verse 42. And he says, He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He looked unto the crucified King of Israel. He saw the crown of thorns on his bloodied head and he proclaimed, Lord. The sinner proclaimed the great truth about the Saviour, that he was Lord and that he had a glorious kingdom. He acknowledged that this Jesus was no ordinary man, but rather he was the Lord from heaven. He was the very door to salvation. It brings to memory of Jesus' conversation with the unbelieving Pharisees in John 8. He said to them, Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Church, unless we believe the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ, his death shall do you no good. We must believe that he is not just a mere man, but rather he is the son of the living God. He is the great I am, the great Jehovah. The only one who is capable of taking away the sins of the world. Thirdly and finally, we know in our text the realisation of faith alone. The realisation of faith alone. Look down at verse 42 once again. He said unto him, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh, what great proof we have in these pages of salvation of faith alone. The condemned sinner, while hung on that cross, he had no time to be baptised. He had no time to take the Lord's Supper. He had no time to belong to a church. He had no time to do any works of service. Yet our Lord granted unto him eternal life by simple childlike faith in him. All the sinner was to do was to look unto the Saviour, believe upon the Saviour, call upon the Saviour, and he would be delivered from his sins. Dear sinner, Jesus Christ is able to save them to the uttermost who come unto God by him. Even the vilest of sinner, even the most wretched of sinner, shall be forgiven if we would only come to the Saviour by faith and faith alone. Not relying upon his works, but relying upon God's mercy. Not relying upon religion, but relying upon God's grace. Not relying upon anything but the salvation he offers through the cross of Calvary. Oh, what great words of assurance our Lord gives unto this penitent thief. Verily, most assuredly, I say unto you today, today shall you be with me in paradise. My friend, this same assurance can be given unto you. The same security and salvation can be yours if you leave behind your pride, leave behind your trust in your human merit and cling wholly to the cross of Jesus Christ. Good work shall not secure it. Giving money shall not grant it. Baptism shall not give it. But only faith alone in Christ alone shall secure your salvation for this condemned sinner cried out to Christ in faith and said Lord remember me he looked under the crucified king of Israel and said Lord remember me and then and only then was he saved and delivered into the kingdom of Jesus Christ such simple words we'd, we would do well not to complicate such simple words we would do well not to confuse our Lord said he who believes in me shall not perish but have eternal life 
What a simple yet profound invitation all of mankind would do well to heed. Just as Joshua, all those years ago, put forth to the nation of Israel, so too do I extend to you an invitation and a decision which must be made. I extend it to you this on a more grander and a more significant scale. I set before you today life and death. I set before you today salvation and condemnation. I set before you today heaven and hell. So the question is, which thief are you? Are you on the one on the right? Are you the one on the left? Are you the one who mocks? Are you the one who believes? Are you the railer? Or are you the one who has faith? For you see, all mankind must make a decision, must make a choice to accept the Saviour or to reject him. Friend, if you've yet to make that good and righteous choice to believe upon the Son of God, I implore you while you have a beating heart, I implore you while you have a conscious mind to receive him today. May the precious Holy Spirit convict you and draw you to the Saviour. Today is the day of salvation and today if you will believe upon him, he shall reply unto you those most blessed words, you shall be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the words in the Gospel of John that says, whoever believes in you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, what assurance it brings to us, Lord, us who have accepted the call of salvation. But, Lord, if there are some here today who have not made Jesus their Saviour, have not called upon your name in faith, I pray, I pray, Lord, that today shall be, to be the day. Throughout our churches here in Toowoomba and throughout Australia, throughout the world, Lord, on this Good Friday, we pray that many would come to salvation in the sun. Lord, as they see these crosses out the front, Lord, may they be reminded of the sacrifice which was given to them on Calvary. Lord, that you were made a curse for us, that we can then receive your righteousness by faith. So Lord, I pray you would draw many to salvation throughout uh, this period of Easter. We pray, Lord God, your name would be exalted. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I want to keep everyone's heads bowed this morning and close your eyes. I want to extend that, that invitation to you. I know some 10 years ago, pretty much to the day, I myself was saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I called upon his name in faith. If that's you today, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your saviour, if you've not come to the end of yourself, maybe you've been in church your whole life. Maybe this is the first time you've been in church. But if you've not received Jesus Christ as your saviour, I pray today shall be your day. Don't go home without receiving Jesus Christ. Do not go home without settling your eternity. If that's you, just raise your hand. It's only between you and God. No one's going to see but you and God. If that's you, Lord, if that's you, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ, do not go home without Jesus Christ. Do not go home without Jesus Christ. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, that we are saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that the angels are rejoicing in heaven, Lord. And Father, um, as we pray, Lord God, we pray that you would help us to be your servants, to give that message of grace to the community here in Toowoomba, that so many people need that salvation message. Lord, many have been confused by religion. Many have been confused by, by all these things, by atheism and by all the deceits of the world. But may we bring to them the truth of Jesus Christ crucified for them. Lord, help us to give that message. And we pray that many souls will be saved. Many countless souls will be saved from destruction and shall have eternal life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.